Well, good morning, church. He is risen. risen. Amen. Amen. Have you noticed that when you have your mask on and wear glasses, it's hard to get your mask off without ripping your glasses off? Have you noticed that? And have you noticed if you got your mask on, you wear glasses, you can't see through your glasses? (laughs) I told the other servant, that's one of those tribulations Jesus warned us about. Amen? (laughs) But we shall survive because we serve a risen God. Amen? Amen. This is a hard duty. You don't have a podium here. But you can blame the senior pastor for that. (laughs) I want to share a scripture with you pertinent to the day of resurrection, which you all will be familiar with, no doubt, when I share it with you, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. It says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus, because he's risen. Amen? They were looking in the wrong place. Uh, Last service, I met a brother who had been to Israel, and he said they showed him the tomb. He said, guess what? It's still empty. (laughs) The rich man only loaned it to him for three days anyway. And then still within Luke 24, the trip to Emmaus that most of you will be familiar with is one of my favorite stories in the New Testament. It says, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together all of all the things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Now, we don't really know how he did that, and it's not necessary to, but I can tell you the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verse 12, says that he was seen in a different form. He had received his glorified body. And those of us, brothers and sisters, who die in Christ are going to have one too. Amen? So let's go to him in prayer right now. Lord, we can barely explain, much less relate to how our Heavenly Father gave up his only son for an imperfect people, but he did. We can only believe, though not understand, how our Lord, who was dead, could rise again and remained alive today, but he did and he does. Lord Jesus, because you died for us, give us the power the determination to live for you, Holy Spirit. Come live within us and teach us the ways of Jesus Christ that we may help grow your kingdom here at hand. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen.
Jesus' name. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my dream. Till I met you. Come on, don't get tired now. We're just getting started. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn. Till I met you.
so much Lord Jesus for the price you paid that it was only because of your victory that we now have life and life to the fullest in you we're so grateful that as we have gathered together we've done it for the reason of drawing closer to you right here right now celebrating a life that was paid for a life that was laid down but also rose again. We are grateful that each and every one of us can be partakers of that gift that whoever believes have been given the right to be called the children of God. So God, help us, Lord, wherever we are. Reach us, Lord. Grab hold of our world. Help distractions just melt away that we might see you and glorify your name and accept that gift of salvation that you have paid. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and in Jesus' name we all say amen. Somebody praise the Lord in the house. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you, praise team. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I've actually remembered to do this right now. If we have any first-time visitors here today, first-time guests, uh, we just want to recognize you. Anybody here for the very first time to a service at Crossroad? Just raise your hand. There you go. There you go. Woo, look at him over there. Amen. Anybody else over here? Got anybody over here? Okay, right there. Yes, over here. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, ushers, that might give you an idea of how many welcome packets we need to have around that round table. When you leave today, go to the round table. You'll see welcome packets there. And please pick one up and then take it to your left to the welcome center. And they've got a wonderful gift for you. And we're just grateful, grateful to have you worshiping with us here today. Amen. Amen. Okay, now kids, we don't want you rushing all over each other. But uh, you're going to go out those doors right there. And so why don't we just thank God for our kids. Amen. Thank God for the kids and the teachers. Amen. You can walk right out that door. And while they are walking out, I, I just see Bill, Bill Stewart right there. How are you doing, Bill? Wave a hand, wave a hand. I know some of you are saying, who's Bill Stewart? Who is that? Well, if you'd have been at our old Napa building, you might have seen him up on our drums. He's a drummer that used to drum in our praise team, but he decided to leave the state. So what can we do? What can we do? But he's visiting us today. Aren't you glad to have Bill Stewart in the house today? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. I was able to uh, finish reading Charles Finney's autobiography. I don't know if, if you've ever done that. Anybody remember who Charles Finney is? Anybody remember? You're kidding. I'm, a, I'm serious now. Does anybody remember who Charles Finney was? We got just a few hands. That's sad. That is sad. And why was that? Because God used Charles Finney to do one of the greatest revival times in the 1800s we've ever had in the United States ever. And uh, it was awesome to read his book and just read his stories of what was happening in revivals uh, all around the country, not only in the country here, but also in New England, uh, New England, uh, England, and, and of course, yes, upper north and, and different places. And for decades, decades, God used him to have just outbreaks of revival. And he talked about being in places and the Holy Spirit doing a move that he could go into certain places and, and, and one either by the leading of the Holy Spirit and they could sense the Holy Spirit's work in people's lives. When people stood up, if, if the Spirit was behind it, he, he could sense what was going on and how these out, outbreaks of revival would happen over many decades. And he talked about in the late uh, 1850s into 1860 and just the, the incredible uh, upper northern revivals that were going on. At that, at that time and place. He speaks about somebody came from Nebraska. And, and of course, they didn't have cars. They didn't have all that. So if you came from Nebraska, you were most likely doing it by, by horse or if you were catching the right trains. But this individual wanted to find Charles Finney. And when he found him, he said, it's just revival all over the country, all over the north. He said, from Nebraska until I got here, I never ran out of a place that wasn't having a revival. Either I found a revival meeting or a revival, a prayer thing that was going on because that accompanied the revivals that people got together to pray and just believe God to move. He said, from Nebraska to here, I never ran out of a place to be at. Every single night he was able to find a meeting. Can you imagine that uh, happening? And, and back then, the West wasn't all developed at that point. So Nebraska was almost like being as far west as you could. 2,000 miles, he never ran out of a place to have a meeting. That's how much God was doing. One of the things Charles Finney said was at that time, right up till 1860, the big, biggest revivals were going on in the north of the country. And he said in the south, they couldn't hardly do anything. They couldn't hardly get anything done. He said people were religious but they weren't able to get revivals going on. There was resistance, and can you imagine why? 
See, at that time, when God was moving, when God was moving by his spirit, then there became in people the, the sense of knowing and understand how wrong slavery was. And so the pressure was mounting on the South to be able to deal with this situation. And, and they weren't dealing with it. And here's what I want you to understand. When the South was having this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the, I mean, when the North was, the South was not. How many of you know if you draw near to God, God draws near to you? Which means if you will not draw near to God, then God doesn't draw near to you. And when Charles Finney said how explosive the revivals were in the North and how little they could do in the South, and we were just about ready to have a civil war. And can you imagine God wanted to move to stop it all? He wanted to move and he was doing an outpouring, but only half the nation was moving in it. And it didn't mean all the people were, but there was a large amount of believers. They, they were talking about uh, just, just a, a half million in a certain amount of time in the north giving their hearts and lives to God. Uh, see, it's hard for us to understand that today, but it was happening there. And it was happening by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let, let me tell you something. Today, this is Easter, we celebrate the resurrection on this day. How many of you know there's people in the world that think you guys are crazy? You're crazy. You're just being religious. You're just going in here and doing a religious thing because it can't be real that your Lord and Savior is alive. Now, let me tell you, when you know he's alive and when he gets in here and his alive spirit begins to affect you out there, that's what we call the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection to change my life, the power to draw me to himself, the power to understand for the first time, what does this salvation really mean? I went to church and I was religious and I didn't know Jesus. I had perfect attendance pins and I didn't know Jesus. It wasn't until somebody introduced me to that personal relationship that my life was changed. And anybody in any place that is resisting that, here, here's what I remember. I came in when they called it the Jesus movement, when a lot of people all around, the, anybody remember the Jesus movement? You don't remember Charles Finney, but you remember the Jesus movement. Okay, the Jesus movement, a lot of people all over the country were coming in. And so a lot of people were accepting. There was also a lot of people resisting. And a lot of religious groups, and they didn't know what to do with all these people that were, were getting saved, that were getting born again. They didn't have the glasses to see it. They, didn't, they couldn't see the kingdom. It's not until the kingdom touches you that you can then begin to see the kingdom happen. You know, when, the, when they came to Jesus and, and, and Nicodemus and he says, we know who you are. That's what Nicodemus said. We know who you are. You're a man come from God. Because so, nobody could do these things except God was with him. So basically he was saying, I got, I got glasses to see who you are. I know who you are. And Jesus turned around and told him, except a man be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Basically, Nicodemus said, I could see. And Jesus said, you can't see. You can't know anything about it until you come into it. And there are people resisting the kingdom today who think you're crazy that don't know anything about it. And we, in this place, I pray and hope we all know about it and that we personally are not resisting what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Because Charles Finney was part of revivals all around this nation because he ran into people who God moved on their heart and they stopped resisting what God wanted to do. And when resistance went down, the incredible things went up. When resistance went down, revivals happened and people got saved. The, in, in many places throughout his book, he said people came to the place where they didn't know anybody that wasn't converted in the town. Can you imagine? You know, that there's, we don't know anybody in Georgetown that's not saved. Or we don't know anybody in Seaford that's not saved. This is how strong the revivals were. That, that they got to where they consumed the whole towns because a low resistance to the Holy Spirit was manifest in their midst. Some of you might not remember this, but I remember this. We were planning something in Milton, and uh, it was going to be an outside event, and we ch made sure the day before to make sure it was going to work with the weather, and the weatherman came on WBOC, and he says, it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be wonderful, great, great. 
So we're like, okay, we're good. You know, we thought it was, but there, he's still saying it's good weather, so it's going to happen. Well, by the end of the next day, uh, my father's uh, chicken houses, we had uh, laying hens and this big heavy roof on one of his older one had tar roofs on it. We had retarred, very heavy roof. By the end of that next day, that roof was totally off that chicken house. It had blown, we had such winds that it tore down trees and, and ripped off that roof uh, on, uh, well, I think we called it number eight or something back there, it ripped its roof off. So we were very interested to hear the newsman the next night, the weatherman, <laughs> to see what he was going to say on why his forecast was so wrong. Because we're like, what happened? We were supposed to have a great day, and now we had strong enough winds to lift roofs off chicken houses. And he, he gets on there, and we're all watching. He says, I know, I know. I've been hearing it. I said it was going to be a great day today, and instead we got all these devastating winds. He said, well, the reason we didn't see it coming is because something happened that's never happened before. We had a record low. They recorded a record low right here in Sussex County. Record. Never had a lower measurement in the barometric pressure, or it was a record low. And you know what happens in a record low? It literally creates a vacuum. And it says it is so low it needs to be filled. And all the winds from the north, east, south, west, everything rushed in to fill that vacuum. And it came in so fast. Everybody, everybody thought it was going to be a good day. But when they had four high systems moving out, which created a, a low. And then what did it do? It turned around and rushed back in and tore up things and, and just was incredible. And I remember, why do I still remember that newscast to this day? Because I was a believer and I thought about the Holy Spirit. What happens when a believer has a record low in resisting the Holy Spirit? No, a record low resistance. It is like, Holy Spirit, do what you want to do. Remember when Jesus said, I'm going to go away and wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. And for 10 days, the Bible says, Luke, Luke says, that they were praying every day in the temple. Every day, for 10 days, just not doing anything else, obeying what Jesus had said. And they waited 10 days. And on the 10th day, the Holy Spirit came in like a what? Like a rushing mighty wind. Because I believe on the 10th day, it was a record low. It was a record low. What was Charles Finney talking about in those towns and those revivals? It was record lows. It was God was sweeping in. The Holy Spirit was doing what he wanted to do. And I'm telling you, God is always, always, always looking to see what your resistance is. And when you have high resistance, you have low activity of the Holy Spirit. And when you have low resistance, you have a, a whole lot of activity by the Holy Spirit. And how do you want to be? How do you want God to sense who you are? Do you want it to be high resistance? Remember the Bible says, don't resist. Don't, don't hinder the Holy Spirit. The Bible knows what it's talking about. Because if you hinder it, you will miss out what God would do with you. And he'll go do it with the one that's low resistance. So towns up north in Charles Finney's book were having an incredible revival within the... the the decade or less before the Civil War. In the South, they were having more religious services, but not much revival because they were resisting what the Holy Spirit was saying to them. And the same thing, you can see one church get on fire and God can be moving while the other one is being stoic and, and religious and not understanding and not having anything happening. Anybody remember in your life when God wasn't doing a whole lot? You may have believed in him, but if you had resistance to him working in you or a total lack of understanding, you may have seen very low to no activity. Yet when God is not being resisted, whew, what the power of God can do. How many of you know, because the Holy Spirit resides in here and it is the power source of God. Amen. Amen. And when I say in here, I don't mean Rick Betts. I mean all of you, you, you know. All right, look at these scriptures here, beginning in Acts. Look what it says. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all, all of them. 
maybe, maybe in our history of at least recording, this may have been the lowest resistant moment on the earth we've ever known. The Holy Spirit was poured out in such a way that, that we don't hear of anything about sins. We don't hear of anything about people thinking in the wrong way. The Holy Spirit was doing things. People were being healed. They, they spoke in boldness. Uh, the, the Bible says that they, when they said, Lord, they've threatened us now, and, and, you be, and it says the place was shaken with, uh, uh, where, they were, they, where they were in, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they went out preaching boldly the, the Word of God, living that bold example, and all these great things. It was so powerful in God that when the first person finally told a lie, they died. Would you not say that's some pure power? <laughs> pure power. And how did that much power accumulate in one place? Because of low resistance. Low resistance. They were willing to let God do what God wanted to do. Why was Jesus so powerful? Because there was no resistance to the Holy Spirit. He says, whatever, you know, I don't go anywhere except the Spirit tells me. I don't go anywhere except my Father tells me what to say. Low, just no resistance at all to what the, the, his Father and the Holy Spirit wanted Jesus to do. Keep going to the next one. Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the what? It is the power. The power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So this Jesus who arose from the grave... That power is locked up in the gospel. When you believe it, that power gets in you. And if the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, then he will raise your body. You may say, but it's getting old. And, and if God doesn't come back, I'm going to see it die. Yeah, and God's going to raise it up anyway. If the spirit that raised him up is in you, that power will be there when that day comes. This is the power we're talking about to change lives, to change people, to change your neighborhood, to change your workplace. You may say, how that's going to happen? One person at a time. It's going to happen one person at a time. How are you going to change the neighborhood? One person at a time. But it, it, it doesn't change, it change if you're not open to the Holy Spirit to do His work. If you are resisting the Holy Spirit, when he says, go talk to your neighbor, when he says, do that good thing for them, when he says, and you, you are resisting, you, you, just want, you just want peace, you just want to be in your house, you just want to do your own thing, well, then don't worry about the wind blowing because you're resisting what the Holy Spirit could do. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, And my speech, and this is Paul speaking, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You know, sometimes we look in the natural and we want to see that wise, intelligent person. We want to see that one of great stature and somebody that looks good. And, and, and we're looking for some of those things. And God doesn't need that at all. He just needs a heart that's sold out and won't resist the Holy Spirit. And God can do the incredible. And look at all he did with Paul. Yet, yet the word seems to confirm he was not a man of great stature. He wasn't a man of great speech. He was able to write really well. He says, but, but what we did with you was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see, we believe because God reveals himself, and he re reveals himself through his Holy Spirit. And how can he keep revealing to me if I'm resisting the Holy Spirit? You know, you listen to somebody else's testimony. Well, you ought to have a few yourself. And most of them come due to a low resistance to the Holy Spirit. My dear, we don't seek him out. We don't ask. You know, he says, you have not because you ask not. If, if, if you're not, you know, who's going to get the kingdom? Who's going to learn the things about God? He said, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. Some of us aren't hungry anymore. Say amen or oh me. We can come to church, but we're not that thirsty for God. We can come into fellowship, but I'm pretty much going to be the same person I was all week that I was before I came. Yet God wants it to become more and more a growing relationship, and you understanding more of your God, 
but you know, before the weeks and before the next year happens that you've learned more and, and you're less resistant. You're learning how to flow with the Holy Spirit. Keep going. And we'll end with this one, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, uh, abundantly above all that the pastor can ask or think. Is that what it says? No, that we, we can ask or think. How? According to the power that dwells in the pastor. No, in us. This is not just somebody else's story. This isn't the evangelist's story. This isn't Charles Finney's story. This is our story. Do you understand? He's speaking to you. God can do more than you could ask or think, exceedingly more. You can have things happen that would just blow your mind if you didn't know things about the kingdom. God wants to move by his Holy Spirit in power and in demonstration through your life. Come on, church, are you hearing me? That's a good place to say amen, amen. (laughs) I hope the Lord is speaking to you today. All that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to how many generations? Oh, this isn't just for Pentecost. This isn't just for the 1800s with Charles Finney. This isn't in the 1950s and 60s with Billy Graham. This is right now with us. The opportunity for everybody that is heard in these services, everybody that's heard online, everybody can have God doing more than you could ask or think. What does it take, though? Low resistance. Where? Everywhere. Go to your job. Have low resistance to God. Watch what God can do. You know, it, it is amazing when, when simply God shines through your light. We've talked about it, the light. Keep the light on. Let the Spirit do His thing. Have low resistance. Have an ex- expectancy that God can do something. You know, I've had twice in my life where, where people came and just stopped me and said, I don't know what it is you have, but I've got to have it. And that they were the easiest, easiest moments to lead somebody to salvation. Because what did God do? He, he shone through you. The Holy Spirit uh, lit the way, and, and then he makes a heart get hungry. He makes them get thirsty, and then they just say, what is it? You know, think about this. Paul and Silas whipped on the back, locked into the deepest part of the prison. The jailer who locked them in there begins to hear the singing. They're not cursing at him. They're praising their God. Then the earth shakes. The chains are loosed. The poor poor prison guard thinks he's lost everybody. He's about ready to kill himself. Don't do it. We're all still in here. And he was so impacted by what he saw of the Holy Spirit, he fell on his knees and said, what must I do to be saved? And it swept in him and his whole household. All because of what? Low resistance to God. Low resistance to what the Holy Spirit wanted to do. Some of us, we get whipped on the back. We're mad. How come you let that happen to me, God? And he was just looking for something. Give me some low resistance. I'll save the jailer. Give me some low resistance. I'll save that man to put you in prison. Or even that one that lied against you to put you there. God is looking and just seeing who will walk by the fullness of that Holy Spirit because he's got plenty of people prepared to come along your path. He's got plenty of people that he can put next to you if you would just let the Holy Spirit do in you what he can do. We've got a story here today of just that. On Easter, we try to have a story. We try to have somebody come. This is a story of God guiding somebody and doing things maybe they didn't think that that God would do. They had other plans, but God directed them to a moment, a time, and a place that he could see a life of God like he's never seen before and in the end get hungry and find God. And the thing is, we all have the potential to have one of these right in our lives too. Somebody that God is preparing to get next to you, maybe at your workplace, maybe at your house, maybe in your neighborhood, just so they can see light in you 
and God can use it to make them hungry. I'm going to ask Nick, come on up, Nick. This is Nick DeSalvo. Will you welcome him as he comes? And he's going to share his story about how God brought him to a moment and a place that changed his life. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Pastor Rick. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Happy Easter. It, it's, it's truly amazing to see this place as packed as it is. Uh, COVID has really, you know, kind of ruined a lot of plans over the last year, but he can't ruin the church and ruin us, Amen. you know, and it, it's wonderful to see everybody here today, and I'm, I'm very glad to be able to share my story. Uh, when I was asked to do this about two weeks ago, you know, I, of course, I tried to prepare and talk because Pastor Rick makes it look so easy. However, you know, uh, it took me down an emotional roller coaster that, you know, I hadn't really visited, you know, since those times had left me. Um, and I, I pulled up my phone. I went to Facebook. The first thing I, that I saw on there was a, uh, you know, a picture, and it said, doors are opening. You know, the wait is not punishment. It's preparation. You know, and, and I truly believe that very, very much so. And when I reflected on, you know, the path that has brought me here, a lot of things made sense that, you know, you know they weren't quite decisions that, you know, if I had, it, it was up to me, I would have made a choice. You know, but it, it was it was God's doing, and it's God's reason why I'm here today to be able to share this with you. Uh, and my story starts about 25 years ago, as far back as I can remember. And I live with my mom, and as far as long as I can remember, my parents were separated, and my dad was an over road truck driver, so he wasn't home typically. And you know, I, I live with my mom up in Kent County, Dover area. Uh, and you know, she she did her best to take care of us. I had a roof over my head, you know, food in my belly. Um, you know, I had a place to stay, and for everything I knew in that time frame, I was, I was comfortable, I was happy. Uh, but what, what, you know, what was going on around me, I wasn't aware of. I wasn't old enough to, you know, kind of know what was going on in my life besides the fact that, you know, I was a kid, and, and, and you know, I needed my mom and my parents around to take care of me. Uh, and my mom's from, from Wilmington, so all of her family's from Wilmington, and she grew up that way. Um, and they would come down on weekends, and my grandmother and my aunts, they would, you know, they'd, they'd get me all dressed up, and they'd take me to a church. And every time I came down, it was a different church. Uh, you know, and they, that, that was my first introduction to, you know, going to church and to what, what, what God, you know, who God is. However, the version I was getting isn't the real version. Uh, you know, we'd come home from church, and at the same night, everybody would get together, and they'd, they'd go out in the kitchen, they'd be partying, they'd be doing drugs, they'd get fighting and arguing, they'd... You know, they would, you know, they, they'd steal from people to, you know, to, to, you know, feed their needs and their habits. And, you know, I was still young enough to know that that's not a life that I wanted. You know, I, I knew that that wasn't right. I didn't know what was right, but I knew that wasn't it. And, uh, you know, as I got older, you know, I, I've seen, you know, that group of people, they struggled. They struggled to hold jobs. They struggled to, to keep a house. Um, you know, unfortunately, my aunt struggled, and, and she ended up losing all of her kids, um, and then a few years ago, she's actually, she passed away from overdose, uh, and she never really, never really had the opportunity to even see her kids grow. You know, to me, that was unacceptable. It's not a life I wanted. Uh, you know, as I got older, I, I went into high school. I said, well, you know, I'm going to learn to weld. So I went to Polytech High School with aspirations. I was going to learn a skill, and I was going to hit the road, and I was going to go. I was going to get out of Delaware. I was going to go make some money. I was going to travel the country, and, uh, you know, I was going to go, you know, get away from all of this. Well, I'm standing here today because I didn't get out of Delaware. I'm still here. Uh, and like I mentioned, you know, it, it's, it's, if it was my choice, I wouldn't be here today to speak to you. You know, but it's God's, it, it's God's plan. I'm here today because uh, I believe somebody needs to hear this message. Although my story is unique, somebody's probably going through a similar uh, scenario. And as I got older, you know, I got a job. My first job was working for Brass Sales at Felton. And I didn't make a lot of money, but I made a little bit of money. And you know, I made enough to, you know, to put fuel in my vehicle and, and, and you know, make some money to eat and buy work clothes, tools, et cetera. Uh, and we had gotten to a point where, you know, my mom had bought a house or bought a trailer in a trailer park. And, you know, she was very proud of that. And I was proud of her for doing that. However, she couldn't let the bad things go. And, the, you know, her habits eventually caught up to her. And I was down at my dad's one weekend when he was home. And we called mom, said, hey, mom, you know, we're coming home. We're excited. Let's go do this. You know, let's have some fun. Uh, and, you know, the toughest, you know, probably the toughest phone call I ever had was, you know, you know her crying, crying on the other end of the phone and said, you can't come home because you don't have a home anymore. And, you know, next, you know, two or three years was kind of a struggle because 
having a permanent home, we were kind of homeless. But, you know, we had family that took us in, stayed with an aunt, uh, you know, in a, in a two-bed, one-bath house. There's three adults, three kids, and you know, it got kind of small pretty quick. And I, I got very comfortable on the couch. Um, we stayed there for a few months and went and lived with a friend in, in similar scenarios. It was a small place, you know, but they opened their doors up to us. Uh, and at the second place is where, you know, I had gotten a job and I started working. And it came up that, you know, the people we were living with there, somebody stealing from them. You know, credit cards were being maxed out, stuff had gone missing. And, you know, the blame was put on me. You know, well, he's got to be taking it because, you know, look, he's, he's getting this or getting that. Well, I had a job. I mean, I was working and paying for things. And when I would come home, I would empty my pockets. I'd put everything in a hat, and I'd sit it on a dresser because the next morning I'd get up, I'd get ready for school, I'd go to school, and then after school I went to work. And, you know, I was like, man, you know, I put some, I said, I'm missing money. I said, I don't know what happened to it. And, you know, or I'd go looking for, you know, some movies. My movies were gone. Um, and every time I'd look for something, something just so happened to be missing. And I thought, well, you know, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in and out all the time. Maybe I'm misplacing it. And when the whole scenario came up about somebody stealing from the people we were living with, you know, I kind of realized that it was my mom stealing from me to feed her addiction. And, uh, you know, that was a tough pill for me to swallow, you know, but at the end of the day, she was my mom, and, and you know, I didn't disown her. You know, I, I was upset about the situation, but I knew, you know, that at the same time, that's all I had. And the conversation came up that, that they were calling the cops and that she was going to be arrested. And so, you know, I caught one and I said, hey, mom, I said, you know, here's what's going on. So you either need to go or you're going to jail. And, you know, that conversation, you know, ended up with me getting the last few items that I owned thrown out of the house out into the yard and both, you know, my brother and I getting kicked out of there, you know, along with my mom. And so I loaded everything up in the back of a pickup I had. And, uh, you know, I called the next person I could think of, which was my uncle who lived in Smyrna. And he said, you know, you know, you know come on, uh, you know, you can stay here for a few days to figure things out. And we did that. And, uh, you know, so I, I packed everything up the truck. I'm hitting the road. I get to my uncle's and, 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 you know, I called my dad. He had given me a cell phone so we could stay in touch. You know, because he knew things were, were kind of rough. And, uh, you know, I called him and said, hey, Dad, here's what's going on. And he was out in the Midwest, uh, headed to California, I believe. And, you know, the company he was working for over the road. He called him and said, hey, you know, i got to load him, go in this direction. i, I got to go. i got to go take, get my kids. And he dropped the trail wherever he was at, and he came home. He was there, you know, within two days. And, and you know, that was really the first time that I had somebody. That, you know, he was my father. It's something that maybe he should have done, but... You know, somebody I felt went completely out of their way and, and gave something up for me to take care of me. And he was, he's, he's with a woman. Um, they're not married, but they've been together for about 25 years, named Roberta Hensley. Some of you may know her. She's grown up at Seaford her whole life. But I do believe God put that woman in my life because she, she's my angel on earth. And she opened her, her, her house up to me and my brother and my dad to, to move in with her, you know, because we had nowhere else to go. And, uh, you know, at this time, she was 50 or 55 years old. Her kids were growing out of the house. She was living a retired, retired life, and she was enjoying it. And, you know, she said, I, I, you know, I wasn't sure how it was going to work out raising two more kids, you know, but, you know, she was very thankful and blessed to have us in her lives. And, uh, and you know, it's just one of those, as a first part, you know, first time in my life where somebody took me in and loved me as their own, even though I wasn't. And to this day, I, you know, you know, she's my stepmom. I do anything in the world for her. And, uh, you know, around this whole time frame where all this stuff was happening, I, I decided I want to join the Army. And so I signed up for reserves because I figured, well, that's maybe that'll be my ticket out of here. And, uh, you know, I was doing my reserve weekends. And, uh, you know, I was like, man, I was kind of hanging out with the wrong people. And I said, I need to get out of here, go do something so I don't, you know, get myself in any more trouble. Well, I get to my recruiter and say, hey, dude. And I said, Send me active duty. I want to get out of here. And his response was, okay, well, you, you know, your ASVAB score is pretty good. Let me see what I can get you. And he comes back to me about a week later. He said, uh, you know, here, I got a job for you, but you don't get to leave for two years. And <laughs> so, I mean, still in Delaware, you know, <laughs> at this point, um, which was fine. And Danny I was like, man, you know, that's a bummer, but, you know, whatever, I'll take it. Well, a couple of weeks go by, and I'm on my way home from my civilian job back to my stepmom's house, and I get T-boned on a straight road. I mean, it's not an intersection, ironically. I mean, the car just smacks me in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, luckily I didn't really, I walked away from it for the most part, but I suffered some, some nerve damage in my left knee, which hindered my, you know, my PT, and I wasn't really able to train like I was supposed to. 
for reserves, and, and I was given the opportunity to get out of my contract early without penalization, and I took that route. At that same time, I had you know, reconnected with a, with a young lady that I went to middle school with, and uh, you know, we ended up going to separate high schools, but we reconnected, and, and you know, I was like, well, I'm going to go to work. And I went home, I'd grab a shower, I'd head to her house, hang out. And, you know, a lot of the people that I was hanging out with that weren't the best people I had kind of separated from. Uh, and that woman's now my wife. And, you know, I'm very thankful for that because, you know, those, those two women were really kind of a, a guiding light for me to change direction and make, make better choices. Um, you know, a few years go by, and I had mentioned this in the last service, that I was on a 30-year plan, Okay. And I told my, my dad and stepmom, I said, I'm not moving out until I'm at least 30. I said, because, you know, I'm working on the road all the time. I said, I'm not going to, you know, pay for a house I'm never in. Because when I was in town, I was always at, at, at my girlfriend's house. And, uh, you know, they were fine with it. They were okay with it. But my wife was not. And she said, well, we decided we we're going to get married. We we're going to buy a house. Or we want to move out on our own. And uh, so we bought a house at 22 years old, pretty early. And... Uh, I remember packing everything up in, in my dad's truck and trailer, and I'm getting ready to pull out of the driveway. And, you know, you know I'm a tough guy. You know, I'm not a very emotional person. But, you know, I sat there in the driveway, and I, I, I bawled my eyes out for 10 minutes because, you know, that was probably the best time in my life that I could remember, and I was leaving it. And not knowing the journey that, that was taking place, uh, you know, I, you, you can't really foresee the future or expect where you're going to go. I knew where I'd been, and I knew I wasn't going back to that. So we bought a house in Seaford, you know, not too far away. And, uh, you know, I had gotten a phone call one day. said, hey, or, or, you know, what are you up to? And uh, it was a guy I'd worked for when I was younger. And uh, he said, are you working? Do you like your job? I said, ah, man, it's okay. I said, you know, I like it as much as I like working. And uh, he said, what do you want? A, you want a job? I'll take you to Texas. And I said, well, yeah, you know, I've been trying to get out of here for a while. So I was like, cool, you get to go again. Uh, well, long story short, I ended up not going to Texas pipelining and, uh, you know, but my wife and I decided at this point, so we're going we're to move. We're going to go somewhere because, you know, it's evident we want to get out of here. And we had looked to move to Pennsylvania with some family in, in the Reading area. And we sold our house to a gentleman um, that was looking to buy. And just it kind of happened. It was off the market. And you know, something happened pretty quick. And we, uh, then we kind of get the phone call that, you know, my wife can't, you know, go work in another state until she has worked a year in Delaware in order to retain her license. Otherwise, she's starting all over which you know, we didn't want that to happen because she, she had gone through uh, you know, a couple years of school and testing, et cetera, to get her certifications. So I was like, well, man, I guess I'm not leaving now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we, we ended up buying a house 1.1 miles away from where we were. <laughs> I mean, you see, we're not getting too far. Uh, and it, it was, the, the guy who bought our house was a member of Blaze Fire Company. And when I was in Dover, I lived, uh, I lived in the Dover district, and I was a member of Dover Fire Department for a while, and it's something I love to do. Uh, so when I moved down this way, you know, I, I tried getting into a, another department before, and I didn't get in. But he's like, I'm on a board of directors. I'll get your paperwork, get you everything involved, and we'll get you in there. And so I did, filled all the paperwork out, got in, and he was like my mentor for the first year. And, uh, but little did I know, that was just a stepping stone to where I am today. And Around the same time, a good friend of mine had just retired out of the Navy, and he was a life member. It just started coming back around. And uh, I remember the first time we met, and we really had any sort of conversation, was that there was a fire on Airport Road. And I'm a probationary member, so I'm sitting outside the truck, and I'm itching to get on. I said, like, come on, let me go, let me go. And he's a life member, so he's got seniority. He gets on the truck. Well, then they decided they're going to switch trucks. And when they switch trucks, everybody hollers, everybody get on the truck. So I said, cool, I jumped on the truck, and I look out the window, and he's standing out there looking at me. You know, and I was like, man, this guy's going to kill me when I see him later. And, you know, thankfully he did. And I got on scene and said, hey, I'm sorry I took your seat. And he was like, no, no, it's okay. You beat me there. You earned it type of thing. Uh, but, you know, that, that really started a relationship that developed into, you know, he, he's, he's my brother. He's family. And, you know, had I not decided to sell my house to a guy in the fire company, I wouldn't have met this gentleman. And, and for those of you, this is Kevin Green. I knew him as Tater. It took me forever to figure out who Kevin Green was. And, uh, you know, that, that really developed into, you know, a, a relationship that we had. And, you know, his wife and my wife became really good friends. Um, she was watching my daughter when she was first born. Uh, she watched her for the first year of her life, and they're, they're, they're very, very close as well. Um, and my daughter, as she grew older, you know, we thought her house was big enough. We bought her kind of a small place. 
And as she got bigger, she started to walk and crawl. And we had this little you know, playpen for her. And she would get up on the playpen. And she pushed it as far as she could all the way around the house, this way and then back this way. And she left a trail everywhere she went. So I said, well, there goes our living room. Let me, let me, let me fix this. I was going to add on to the house. I got the quote. And the quote to, to add on to the house would have meant we owed more than what the house would ever be worth. So we're like, well, this isn't going to work. So we put the house up for sale. And we found a piece of land we wanted to buy. And uh, long story short, we basically got the land for what we were originally going to offer. And the, the realtor said, I got somebody I think be interested in your house. Can I take a look? I said, sure. So he comes by, and I think the next week he made an offer, and we sold the house in like two weeks. And we were moving out in the middle of a blizzard, mind you. you know, so there, add something to the, to the fire there. Uh, well, I was like, cool. Well, now what do we do? We need a place to stay. Well, we're going to rent a house. Well, that wasn't really feasible. And I knew a couple people who had campers who ironically weren't camping. So I said, hey, can I rent your camper? He's like, yeah, you got money? I said, cool. So we made a deal, and I rented his camper. Uh, I was like, well, now we need somewhere to put it. And at the time, Kevin had a camper set up at uh, our, uh, Pastor Ron Wyatt's house. And for those who don't know, Pastor Ron Wyatt's our visitation pastor. And I was fortunate enough that, you know, they allowed us to take the camper we were renting and place, you know, on their property uh, and, and kind of we refuge in their backyard, mind you. And, uh, you know, we paid them, you know, we paid them some money for electricity and basically our lot rent. And it was a matter of, uh, you know, we we're going to be self-sufficient. We we're going to stay in the camper. We we're going to, ah, you'll never see us, blah, blah, blah. Well, that didn't last very long. And they, they said, if you ever need to come inside, please feel free. You know, come on inside and, you know, use the, use the restroom or whatever you need to do. And then it's one night, you know, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're making this dinner. You want to come join us? And like, well, yeah, cool. Well, long story short, that all ended up into a, a matter of, hey, dinner's at 6. What time are you going to be here? And, uh, you know, it went from just being a, a casual transaction to, to growing into a family. And the time I spent there, you know, I, I'd work late and I'd come home late and I'd sit out there in the living room with, with, with you know, I call him Pop and we would, we would talk. Uh, and he would share the word with me, and he would talk about his experiences and give me, his, you know, small testimonies. And, you know, the exposure I had with him and his family w- was truly the most godly family that I'd ever seen. They didn't just talk to talk, they walked to walk. You know, uh, you know, as I told you before, I, you know, the first people took me to church, they were robbing and stealing people, and, and they are doing everything that I've been told not to do. But that, that was the first example I've had of, of a godly family, and, and I wanted that. And my wife and I were, you know, we've had our issues, and I was not being the best husband. And pretty much she told me, i got to figure something out, otherwise this isn't going to work. And I knew exactly what I needed. And, you know, immediately as I was going through, I was driving down the road one day, and I just heard in my head, I need to see Eli, Eli Gonzalez. And so the business meeting was that Tuesday. And I'm sure you guys have heard the meeting, or the, the, the gentleman who got saved at the business meeting. Well, that was me. Okay. <laughs> And I had a full intention to come to the business meeting just because I wanted to know what the church was about and what was going on. And, and you know, I just wanted to know more about, about this place. And so I come to the business meeting with Kevin, and we're sitting here, and we go through the meeting. And after the meeting, I just kind of got up and walked out. And as I was leaving, you know, I heard it again, see Eli, see Eli. So I went to find Eli. And when I found Eli, I couldn't talk to Eli. You know, I couldn't get words out. You know, I, was just, just, you know, I was just there. I was crying. I was, I was upset. And he's like, I know what you need. Come with me. So Eli and Rhonda had brought me in here right, right there to the steps, and they, they helped me say the Lord's Prayer and get saved that night. And, uh, yeah, no, that's excellent. Go ahead. <laughs> Little did I know, later that week, Eli would be talking to my wife on the phone, uh, and, uh, you know, Eli led my wife through the same prayer. You know, and it wasn't planned. You know, God, it was God's plan. It wasn't our plan, and it just happened. You know, and I couldn't be more thankful for that. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, when I go back and I look at these things, it's amazing what I went through to get to this point. You know, if it was my choice, I would have been gone. You know, I'd have been wherever. I've had all, job offers in Hartford, Connecticut. And we were very gung-ho to go, but when it was time to go, we couldn't pull the trigger. You know, and a few other places as well. And I never really knew what was drawing me here to stay, but now I know. It was God. And, uh, you know, when I, I shared this earlier, doors are opening. You know, the weight was not punishment, it was preparation. You know, had I not gone through some of those experiences of what was bad, I wouldn't be able to appreciate the good that I have. And I think we forget that sometimes, you know. So I, I'm going to leave you with this. You know, today, today is Easter, okay? Uh, 
it, it's a wonderful day. It's, it, it's the day of resurrection. And, you know, it, it's, it, to me, it's a reminder. We need to reflect on, on what has brought us here and what has really, what our life has been up to this point, you know, for us to be resurrected and saved once again. You know, and it, it was a very emotional journey for me to go through. And, uh, you know, I, I try and write notes down and this and that, so I'd have something I could read off of, but I couldn't. And I wrote something down before I left the other night, and I forgot it. So, you know, <laughs> you know, here I am. But this is my story. This is what I've gone through to get to this point. And I pray that, you know, if somebody's here today and needs to hear that message because you're going through something similar, know that where you're at today is not where you'll be tomorrow. Amen. Hey, open your heart to God, and God will take you where you need to be. Yeah, I couldn't be more blessed. I couldn't be more thankful for the opportunity. Uh, you know, and I, I'm, I'm especially thankful to be able to share my testimony with you guys today on Easter. So thank you for listening, and, and happy Easter to everyone. Ooh, amen, brother. And how, how many of you can understand that God may be preparing a Nick to end up in your backyard? <laughs> Preparing a Nick to get on the job site with you. Preparing somebody. Look, look at all the things God had to do to, to get him into that association with the Greens and with the Wyatts. And just so he could end up here at a business meeting and give his heart to the Lord. Give God glory for that. Thank you, brother. Yeah, thank you. Phew, because if you're, if you're not ready for it, if your heart's not open, if you're not used to letting the Holy Spirit lead, you may miss the very opportunity that's in your backyard. I love the fact that even though he wasn't, he and his wife weren't at a place of, of that total commitment, yet they were being asked to come in and be, be that friend. In one of the services, he said we would come and they'd invite us in, we'd have dinner, or they might invite us, we'd join a a card game or something, they'd be playing around the table and just brought them in like family before they became family. Yeah. All right? That you loved them and they were your, you know, you could be a friend with them, influencing them. And what, what were they seeing? They were seeing a godly family like they'd never seen before. And what was going on with them? They were getting hungry. The Holy Spirit in them was making them hungry. And God was drawing them to a moment where something's got to change. And I know what that something is. I just need the Jesus they keep talking about. So who knows who God is bringing into your line of, uh, of touching. And if you're, not, if you're resisting the Holy Spirit, you won't even see who they are. But if you've got an open door for that, watch out. Because the power of God will bring your friends into the kingdom. Amen. Why don't you stay Ooh, amen. And I don't know what the Holy Spirit said to you today, but I believe he was speaking to people. And whatever he said, don't resist it. Have an open heart to what God's saying and how he's leading you. And somebody may be here much like Nick's story and need Jesus. Maybe through this, you already know God's put the hunger in your heart. You already know you need to have this change. And the change is you've got to stop being Lord of your life, and Jesus needs to be Lord of your life. You come off the throne, you put him on it, put him in charge. It's not about you anymore, it's about him. He died on the cross to make that relationship with heaven possible. He removed your sins on that cross and gives you an opportunity to have heaven as your eternal home. He will begin to affect you here in the kingdom of God. If that's you, brother, sister, you know God's calling you to give your life, your heart to him. I can lead you in a prayer of committing your heart, your life, everything to the Lord. And uh, people that are here that already understand that are going to be happy for you. They're going to be happy for you. And they'll support you in the prayer. But you've got to be bold in front of men and women. You've got to identify with Christ. You've got to confess him and say, it's me, Pastor Rick. I need Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. So if that's you, brother, if that's you, sister, be bold. Raise that hand, and we'll say this prayer with you, committing your heart, your life to the living God. Anybody in the room that needs that prayer, raise your hand up high, and we'll say this prayer with you. Right there, brother, right there. Amen. 
Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't want to miss anybody. We got a hand right there. Right here. Is that a brother right there? Right there, a brother. All right, anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, we got a brother here, a brother there. Amen. We had a sister in the last service. That's awesome. All right, well, and, and there may be people watching online right now that have been moved the same way. So l let's say this prayer with them and, and, and just let, believe what, what God has done. He's drawn you to this moment. Just, just let uh, your heart release to him, receive him in as your Lord and Savior. Do this uh, prayer in faith as we pray this together. Let's say it together. Dear Lord, I thank you for today and the words I've heard. You have used them to draw me to yourself. So right now, in front of all these witnesses, I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Come live in me. Thank you for dying for my sin and removing them out of the way. I turn from those sins and choose to live for you. Holy Spirit, come and fill me now. Teach me the ways of Jesus that I might follow after him all the days of my life. And it's according to your word that as I do this, I can confess by faith that I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen and amen and amen. Amen. And listen, for any of you who prayed that prayer, but you, you were not as bold as, as these two gentlemen to be able to raise your hand, but if you meant it, God knows your heart. So please, I'm asking them, both of them, to go over here when the service is over. Pastor Ken, I see you over there. Uh, he's going to be praying with you. He, he's going to give you a brand new Bible if you need it. It's a study Bible. It's a big investment, but we believe you've just made the important, most important decision of your life. And anybody online that did this, please let us know so we could invest in you also. But we say to every, every one of you, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. All right, church, you know what we got? Seven days before we get back here. What are we going to do with it? Let's be open to his leading, open to the Holy Spirit. Listen, just don't resist. Be open. Watch what God will do with you. Every single one of us who has the Holy Spirit in our life, he will lead, he will guide. Incredible things can happen, all to his honor and his glory. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for these ones who gave their heart and lives to you. Thank you that we got to hear this testimony of Nick and thank you for his willingness to do that. And, and thank you, Lord, that as we go out of this place, that you, you are asking and desiring for us to have an intimate relationship with you, to draw near to you as you draw near to us. So thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, uh, reveal yourself power, powerfully, Lord, through your sons and your daughters, and we will give you all the honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.